So good afternoon. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming to this seminar. So today I will talk about the solar irradiance effects on the upper atmosphere on time scales from minutes to multi-decadal. First, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have uh, worked on these topics with me, both inside and outside the NKHAO. So the upper atmosphere me here means the thermosphere and the embedded ionosphere between about 90 kilometers and 600 kilometers. So let's first look at this uh, atmosphere temperature profile here. So the atmosphere is divided into layers based on this temperature profile. So we have a troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and the thermosphere and ionosphere, and then above that is the exosphere. So uh, this uh, thermosphere ionosphere system is mostly uh, is uh, mostly driven by external forcing, which including the solar irradiance uh, and the thermosphere ionosphere coupling with the magnetosphere above and the atmosphere below. And of course, the internal process is also very important, such as internal dynamics and internal uh, electrodynamics. So today, I will talk about the solar irradiance effect on this thermosphere and ionosphere system. So uh, to look at the solar irradiance effect, um, um, let's look at the thermosphere first. So here shows the thermosphere major species uh, on the altitude is on the y-axis versus <coughs> the density on the x-axis. So we have atomic oxygen, uh, molecular nitrogen, and molecular oxygen. So these are the major species in the thermosphere. So there's one characteristic that is dis distinguish thermosphere and the atmosphere below. And the atmosphere below is uh, well mixed. But in the thermosphere, uh, the, the species is separated. Uh, because of the molecular diffusion, and also because the turbulence which mix the atmosphere together uh, essentially cease to exist in the thermosphere. So, uh, and also the lighter species has a larger scale height. Uh, therefore, they decrease, they decrease with altitude, slower than the heavier species. So we see this uh, uh, profile of the O-N2 and O2 look like this. And the winds will change this uh, distribution of this species. So we often talk about the thermosphere composition. We often, when we talk about the thermosphere composition, we often means uh, we often use a ratio of the between the atomic oxygen and the molecular nitrogen, the O and two ratio, uh, which is a measure between the relative concentration between at, between atom atomic oxygen and the molecular nitrogen. So, um, and I will use this O and two ratio a lot later on in this presentation. So while we are looking at this uh, figure, I would like to bring up this uh, O and two ratio here. So this is the solar irradiance spectrum. Um, here shows solar flux on the y-axis and the wavelengths in nanometer uh, on the x-axis. So from shorter wavelengths to longer wavelengths. So here we have X-ray ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, ultraviolet, visible, and the infrared. So the shorter the wavelengths, the, the, the larger the energy of the photon. So here the XUV and the extreme EUV has the largest, strongest uh, energy. So they can ionize the thermosphere, those uh, species and uh, create ions, and uh, therefore create the ionosphere. And uh, here, the colors, the two different colors, uh, uh, the yellow color and the red color. The red color indicates the solar flux at solar minimum. And uh, the red color is solar flux at uh, solar maximum. So here we have uh, solar ir irradiance comes in and ionize O, O2, and N2, and produce the ions. And these ions will react with the neutral. And eventually, these um, molecular ions will um, recombine with the electron back to neutral. And in this process, the photon energy converted to chemical potential energy, and the chemical potential energy uh, rele released and into heat, and heats the thermosphere. 
So through this process, now we have an ionosphere and the embedded ionosphere. And in the ionosphere, the, uh, it is it's mostly, um, it's almost charge neutral. So the electron density is the sum of all this uh, ion um, density, So which shows here this uh, black profile. And the peak of the electron density is uh, called ionosphere F2 peak. So I want to point out, even at uh, this peak, F2 peak, the number of electron and versus the number of the neutral and the, is one versus 1,000. So the ionosphere is a very uh, small part that is embedded in this uh, thermosphere. So we're driven by external forcing and also the internal processes. So there are very, a lot of uh, very complicated variability in the thermosphere and the ionosphere system that are space weather and space climate uh, phenomena. So, so this is uh, what I will talk about today. So here. So the variation in the thermosphere and ionosphere from minutes to uh, hours driven by solar, due to solar flares and go to longer time scales and all the way to multi-decadal time scale that is driven by solar irradiance. And the tools that I will use is the GCMs, uh, which includes NCA TIE GCM, Time GCM, and the Wacom X. And the solar irradiance, solar irradiance input for this GCM is um, from flare irradiance spectral model, the FISM model, which is an empirical solar flux model that is based on observation. And I will also use measurement uh, solar flux from uh, NASA time the sea mission. And I, of course, I also use the thermosphere ionosphere data sets, which includes thermosphere mass density data uh, that is measured by the CHAMP satellite and also from satellite uh, drag data. And the uh, thermosphere composition, which is ON2, uh, that is measured from NASA time the GUVI and the NASA gold missions. And then the total electron content data from global GPS network. So the first, the solar flare. So here shows a solar spectra uh, during this uh, X10 solar flare. So we have solar flux on the Y axis versus wavelengths in nanometer on the X axis. So the black spectru spectrum is the solar spectrum right before this solar flare. And the red is the solar flux at the peak, X-ray peak of this flare. So we see the enhancement of solar irradiance in the XUV, and EUV, and FUV. And this increase of solar irradiance is very, happens very quickly uh, in a matter of usually between 10 to 40 minutes. And uh, this sudden increase of solar irradiance instantly increase ionization and increase the electron density. And this will cause um, a lot of disturbance in the ionosphere, which affect the radio communication and the navigation systems. And also the increased ionization release more heat, and which heats the thermosphere, increase the neutral density, and uh, increase the drag of the, increase the satellite drag and affect the orbits of the low Earth orbiting satellites. So here, the next slide, let's look at the um, measurement, uh, the total electron content from measurement and from our model simulation due to a very large solar flare, the X-17 flare, during the very famous Halloween storms in 2003. So uh, total electron content is the total electron in a vertical column uh, in the ionosphere. So on the left side is the GPS measurement. On the right hand side is the time GCM model simulation. So the, f the top row is shows the TEC right before the solar flare. And the middle row shows the TEC at the peak, X-ray peak of the flare. And the last row, the bottom row shows the difference, which is enhancement due to this flare at the X-ray flare, at the peak, 
So during this flare, the TEC enhancement is about uh, 15 to 25 TEC unit, which is about 15 to 30 percent of the TEC. So that's very large. And uh, one thing that I want to point out is that the effect of the solar flare in the thermosphere and ionosphere not only depend on this uh, magnitude of the flare, but also depend on the location where the flare occurs on the solar disk. So here we are looking at uh, solar irradiance uh, enhancement uh, <coughs> um, du uh, during these uh, two flares. Both of them are X-17 flares, uh, same magnitude, but one is uh, on the solar disk and the other is on the limb. Uh, and uh, so here, this is percentage increase on the y-axis <coughs> versus wavelength nanometer in the x-axis. So we see that this is very, at the very short, short wavelengths, the x-uv, the enhancement from these two flares is the same. And, but in the most part of the EUV, you see that the enhancement of solar in irradiance is much larger um, from the disk flare compared to the limb flare. And this will... Uh, this will show up in the thermosphere and the ionosphere. So uh, here, this is a model simulation of the electron density enhancement in response to these two flares. So on the top, so we have y-axis is a model pressure surface. So here, uh, the approximate altitude of this pressure surface is also marked here. Uh, and uh, the x-axis is a UT time through the day. And so we see that below the 120 kilometers, kilometers um, which is the E region where the XUV dominates the ionization, we see that the electron density enhancement is about the same because the XUV enhancement is the same regardless where the location is. But above this altitude, and the electron density enhancement due to the disk flare is uh, more than two times of the electron density enhancement uh, in response to the limb flare. So, it's my, so the flare location is very important. Now, diurnal variation. So the diurnal variation is uh, driven by the presence and the uh, absence of solar irradiance during day and the night. So we look at this figure. This is a model simulation of global average mass density. Uh, on the y-axis and versus local time on day 81 of 2004 on the x-axis. <coughs> and this is the global average mass density at 400 kilometers at a fixed, fixed location. So uh, uh, I will use, talk about mass density, global average mass density at 400 kilometers a, a lot in this <coughs> presentation. The reason is mass density uh, is a is a dominant factor that uh, uh, determines the satellite, uh, satellite drag. And the 400 kilometers is uh, altitude representing the altitude of the low Earth orbiting satellite. So here we see that uh, the mass density maximizes about 16 local time and minimizes at about 5 local time. And the amplitude between the minimum and maximum uh, is uh, on the order of about 100 percent. And now let's look at the observation and model simulation comparison. So here we are looking at a five-day period in uh, 2007. Um, so on the top row is the, from, is the mass density measured by CHAMP satellite. The bottom is the TIGCM model simulation. On the left side, it's daytime uh, mass density. Right-hand side is the night side mass density. So uh, we see this uh, day-night difference um, of the mass density, both in the measurement and uh, in our model simulation. Next is a solar rotational variation. So uh, solar rotational variation is driven by appearance and the disappearance of the active regions um, in, in the sun uh, when the sun rotates in uh, about 27-day uh, period. So if we look at the left top left figure, so here shows time the sea measurement, from time the sea measurement, the solar irradiance on the y-axis versus the wavelength in nanometer on the x-axis. So the blue is a solar spectrum on uh, day Febu February 25th, 2003, um, F10.7 is 100. 
and uh, red is March 11, 2003. The F10.7 index is 140. So F10.7 index is a solar index for the solar EUV index, a measure of solar EUV. And, and F10.7 usually uh, uh, in the range of from 70 solar at solar minimum to uh, up to like 250 at solar maximum. So here, this is a moderate solar activity condition. So the top, the left bottom figure shows the ratio of these two spec spectra. So we see during this solar rotation, uh, the EUV variation is about 20%, and the F, at the FUV, uh, it's a le less variability. And the, uh, on the right-hand side, this is a model simulation of global average mass density at 405 kilometers, uh, the solid line, and uh, the dashed line, dotted line is the F10.7 index. So here it shows about five solar rotations in 2003. So, uh, so we see this very, see this very, very clear <coughs> solar rotation variation. And, uh, and the corresponding solar rotational variation in, in the mass density. And uh, solar rotational variation in the thermosphere and ionosphere depend on um, solar activity um, being large uh, at a higher solar activity and lower, smaller at a lower solar activity. So here, under this moderate solar activity conditions, uh, the amplitude of solar rotational variation in mass density uh, is on the order of 100%. So now let's look at the, the solar activity dependence of solar rotational variation. So here we are looking at, uh, on the left side is 2003, right hand side is, two, which is moderate solar activity. And the right hand side is 2008, and that which is a very low solar activity. And the top figure uh, is the global average mass density. Um, the blue is the, uh, data from satellite track data, and the red is our model simulation. And the bottom figures are the F10.7 index in uh, green, and the uh, AP index in, in purple. The AP index is the index for geomagnetic activity. So here in 2003, we can see very evident uh, solar rotational variation in F10.7, and the corresponding solar rotational variation in the mass density. But if we look at 2008, so we can see very, see very small solar rotational variation in the F10.7, the green line. And uh, consequently, if you look at the short-term var variability uh, in the, of the, the mass density, most of them is driven by the uh, magnetic activity, which is corresponding to this uh, AP index. And next is the annual and the semi-annual variation. So the annual and the semi-annual annual variation is driven by the annual variation of the Sun-Earth distance, which introduced about 7% variation in uh, solar irradiance. And also, there was a very, very important uh, in, um, driving mechanism that is the internal process, the internal dynamics, the interhemispheric summer to winter circulation which mixes the atmosphere and uh, cause a semi-annual variation. And also, there's, um, sometimes there's a semi-annual variation in geomagnetic activity. And what I found is um, lower atmosphere forcing is also very important to this uh, annual semi-annual variation. So here, let's look at the model simulation of uh, uh, mass, global average mass density uh, at, 200, at 400 kilometers. And uh, this uh, x-axis is the day of year, so this is a one-year simulation. And this is under uh, highest solar maximum, F10.7 is 220. So we see this uh, primary uh, minimum of mass density um, around July, and the secondary minimum around December, and then the max two maximum um, around the two equinoxes. And uh, this uh, amplitude from annual mean to annual maximum uh, really change a lot from year to year. And even the, uh, the phase, you know, when is the minimum, when is the maximum, also change from year, year to year. So this annual, semi-annual variation has a lot of uh, interannual vari variability. Uh, 
and the based on satellite drag data, the amplitude from minimum to maximum can be anywhere between about 30% uh, to 250%. So uh, here, this is a, a long-term satellite drag data, shows the global average mass density at 400 kilometer, kilometers. And uh, so we see um, from 1967 to uh, 2009, so we have about uh, four solar cycle. So first we notice a uh, very large solar cycle variation, which I will talk about later. And then um, if you look at this uh, blue line, uh, for example, if you look at 1976, you will see this uh, uh, embedded a smaller change, which is the uh, annual semi-annual variation that we see uh, in the previous slide. And uh, this uh, annual semi-annual variation is also uh, uh, is also in comp uh, thermosphere composition, the ON2 ratio, which I uh, introduced earlier. Um, so the ON2 ratio is uh, very important. Uh, it is important to uh, thermosphere neutral density because if you have a larger ON2 ratio, that means there is uh, more atomic. Uh, atoms in this mixture of the atmosphere, so you will have a larger sc scale height. So then, so at higher altitude, you will have more neutral density. And the ON2 is also very important to electron density, because in the F2, in the F1 and F2 peak, the electron density is proportional to ON2 ratio. When you have more atomic oxygen, you have you will have larger electron density. And when you have more molecules, the molecular will increase the uh, recombination um, rates, and therefore it uh, uh, reduces the electron density. So, uh, so here we are showing the ON2, which actually is a column ON2 ratio, which is the ON2 ratio in, in a vertical column in the thermosphere. <coughs> so here this is a column ON2 ratio from timed goofy and uh, gold missions. Um, so sh and uh, this is at where the goofy, goofy and the uh, gold observation overlaps. So the top, so this, uh, the top is goofy, the middle is gold, and then the bottom is TIGCM model simulation. And here we are, a y-axis is the latitude we are looking at the northern hemisphere, and the x-axis is from October 2018 to uh, August 2019, so it's almost one year of data. So, uh, uh, so here I want to talk about two, two variations, um, which actually, because here this is a one year, and also I only show uh, northern hemisphere, actually I will use a next slide, which is a zoom in, essentially zoom in to looking at one month. Uh, uh, the top is a goofy, and the the bottom is uh, from TIGCM model simulation. So here we are looking at uh, one month data, and latitude versus longitude. Um, we are looking at the, on the left is January and on the right is July. So I will talk about the two, two variations that is very important. The first is the annual variation. So the annual variation is when you look at the January the, uh, on glo global basis, uh, there's more ON2, the ON2 ratio is larger than the July. And then another variation is a, a seasonal summer to winter difference, which is if you look at here, so this is summer, this is summer, and this is winter, and this is winter. So this, in the summer hemisphere, the ON2 ratio is always uh, lower than what's in the uh, winter hemisphere. And uh, so, uh, and this is in the model as well. and. Uh, so, uh, and, and this, in the electron density, we will have this same type of annual and, uh, variation and uh, the seasonal variation, which really shows uh, the thermosphere, the coupling between the thermosphere and the ionosphere. Which is, so here, let's look at this slide. So, uh, so again, this is 2003, and the left side is January, and the right-hand side is July. And the y-axis is the model pressure surface. So the top figures is the electron density, and the bottom is uh, uh, the ON2 ratio. And uh, so uh, we see that in the ionosphere, it's the same. The, we have larger electron density in January compared to July. 
And in the ionosphere, this is called the ionosphere annual anomaly. And so this, we see this annual variation in, in the composition, OA, thermosphere composition OM2. And, um, and now look at the summer winter difference. So if we look at January, the summer hemisphere, the winter hemisphere, so look at middle latitude. So we have more electron density in the winter middle latitude compared to the summer middle latitude. And if we look at the composition, that's the same way. So this is because if in the, sun, in the winter hemisphere, we have more ON2 here, and then this will, um, this will, uh, this, this is the, the most important reason why we also have a larger electron density in the winter hemisphere. So in the ionosphere, this is called ionosphere winter anomaly. So these two um, variations are different. And uh, really shows the thermosphere and ionosphere, the coupling between the thermosphere and the ionosphere. So the next is the solar cycle variation. So solar cycle variation is driven by the intrinsic 11-year variability of the magnetic activity in the sun. And uh, so here, looking at the solar irradiance measured by time the C on the top left, so we have a, a two spectra. So the blue is August 18th, 2008, F10.7 is 68, and uh, the red is August 18, 2002, F10.7 is 247. So, uh, and the bottom left uh, is the ratio of these two s spectra. So we see that uh, this, uh, through this solar cycle, uh, in the EUV, uh, the solar EUV is a, uh, is, uh, about two, three, even four times of the solar EUV at a solar, at a solar minimum, and with the FUV has less, smaller vari variability. And on the right hand side is a model simulation of global average mass density, the profile, the altitude versus um, mass density here. The blue is the solar minimum with F10.770, and the red is the solar maximum with F10.7 at 220. So if you look at about uh, in the atmosphere about 400 kilometers, uh, the variability through the solar cycle is uh, more than one order of magnitude. So this uh, solar cycle variation is by far the largest variation in the thermosphere and ionosphere. So here shows the global average um, uh, mass density at 400 kilometers from 1996 to 2013. And the black is uh, from satellite drag measurement. And the red is the TIEGCM model simulation. So uh, we see that the TIEGCM models can simulate this solar cycle variation very well through the solar cycle. And this will allow us to understand the physics of solar cycle variation. And uh, so here, if you look at the mass density at the solar minimum and maximum, so that's more than one order of mag magnitude variation. And uh, most of this variation comes from variation in temperature. So here it shows the model simulation. Uh, Y-axis is the model pressure surface. So basically, this, uh, this region would be the upper thermosphere, 300 to 400 kilometers. So here is the lower thermosphere. And, uh, so the blue is the solar minimum and uh, red is solar maximum. So from minimum to maximum in the upper thermosphere, the so temperature variation is uh, more than 400 K. So very, this is a global average, so it's very large. And the, this solar cycle var variation is also showing in the thermosphere composition, the ON2 ratio. So here this is a column ON2. Uh, from time the GUVI measurement. So here showing uh, January and uh, from 2003 to 2007. So we see that ON2 ratio decrease as the solar activity decrease. And I found that most of this uh, solar cycle variation of the ON2 is it occurs in the winter hemisphere. So here shows the zonal average ON2 from previous slide, the uh, goofy measurement for year 2003, which is uh, red, and for year 2007 in blue. So uh, this is January, so the southern hemisphere is, wind, is summer, so here summer has very small variation, and most variability is in the winter hemisphere. <coughs> 
So why, why is this? So the reason is there are two factors that uh, uh, determine the ON2. So the first is the temperature. When you have a higher temperature, you will have a higher ON2 ratio. And the second is the winds. So wind, wind, the wind is upward, so you have uh, the vertical advection will decrease ON2 ratio. When the wind is uh, downward, the vertical advection will increase ON2. And then remember, in the summer hemisphere, it's the, the wind, the vertical wind is upward because we have a lot of solar heating in the summer hemisphere. So the wind is goes up and then, uh, then blow from the summer hemisphere to the winter hemisphere and then become downward. So winter, winter hemisphere is uh, downward. So, uh, so if you look at the summer hemisphere at solar maximum, you will have higher, higher temperature compared to solar minimum. That will lead to a larger uh, ON2. And then in the, at solar maximum, you have stronger upward wind. So that will decrease ON2. So the end result is you will have a very small change in uh, ON2. But if you look at the winter hemisphere at solar maximum, uh, higher temperature at solar maximum will cause larger ON2 and the stronger downwelling also will increase ON2. So you will get a larger increase of ON2 at solar maximum compared to solar minimum. So now the multi-decadal variation. So here, we, again, we're looking at the global average and mass density at 400 kilometers um, from satellite drag measurement. So showing here 19 67 to uh, 2011, so about four solar cycle. And the lower figure is F10.7 index. So, so first we notice again this very large solar cycle variation, and the, which, which corresponding to this F10.7 index. And now if we look, um, look at, just look at solar minimum. So you will see there's a trend uh, of in mass density. Uh, and uh, that is not so much in F10.7 index. And so, um, so this is a trend. And then, so uh, from satellite drag data, um, this, uh, this trend is uh, uh, about uh, the decrease is negative 3% per decade. Um, and the, our model can simulate this, uh, uh, this result, which is uh, very consistent with satellite drag data, data. And from model simulation, we also know that most of this trend is uh, caused by uh, greenhouse gas, which is mainly CO2. And we know that CO2 causes a global warming um, in the troposphere. So how, how it changed from global warming in the troposphere to uh, uh, cooling in the thermosphere. So what happened uh, in between? So uh, let's look at uh, Wagram X model simulation. So here, this is we are looking at monthly mean global average temperature uh, at four altitude from 95 km, kilometer, which is a mass pulse, and a 65 kilometer in the mesosphere, 35 kilometer in the stratosphere, and this, and the zero. This is our surface air temperature. So the data is uh, this uh, red. So before we look at the trend, I w wanted to talk about two things. The first thing is uh, we see this uh, annual semi-annual variation, which at 95 kilometer, it's uh, both annual and semi-annual variation. And, um, and then it's predominantly an annual variation at the other three altitudes. And the second thing I want to point out is at, uh, uh, you can see, so the bottom is the F10.7 index. So at, uh, at the mass pulse, you can clearly see this uh, solar, solar effects uh, in the temperature. And at 65 kilometer, you can still see some solar effects. But at these two altitude, you can hardly see solar effects anymore. Um, and if we do quantify this uh, solar, solar effects, so in a degree per 100, uh, solar flux unit, which is a F10.7 change by 100 unit. So we see that the uh, solar effects decrease monotonically as uh, altitude with uh, decreasing altitude. Uh, 
So now let's look at the trend. So this is a trend by a, a decay per decade. So at the surface, uh, it's a 0 0.17 K per decade. So it's a warming. But uh, in the stratosphere, it's already already cooling, and the mesosphere, mesopause, all cooling. Of course, this uh, is uh, not as large larger as uh, what's in the thermosphere that we see earlier at uh, 400 kilometers. At 400 kilometers, the temperature trend is about 2.5 to 3 K per decade. And uh, our simulation period here is 1980 to 2014. And if you look at IPCC 2018 report uh, during this period, so the warming is 0 0.55 degrees Celsius, which is about 0 0.16 K per decade. So now let's come back to this uh, global average mass density at 400 kilometers. So uh, is this uh, trend in the thermosphere is always 3% per decade uh, and all, all the time? And, uh, and actually, it's, it's not uh, because of the multi decadal change variation in solar irradiance. Uh, so, for example, if you look at this uh, two solar minimum, uh, minimum 1996 uh, versus 2008 2009, we see actually the mass density decrease is 25% uh, uh, instead of 3%. And if we look at F10.7 index, uh, it is a decrease of 4%. And this 4% of uh, decrease in F10.7 will cause about 8% in mass density decrease at 400 kilometers. So if you add 8% and 3% together, it's 11%. So it does not add up to 29%. So, um, so what is the problem here? So the problem is because F10.7 index has a floor at a low solar activity. So here we compare F10.7 index with another solar UV index, magnesium to core to wing ratio index, which is in red here, F10.7 is black. So if you look at 2008, 2009, you see the F10.7 level off, but the red continue to decrease. So we use this uh, red index in our model simulation and uh, Recall that uh, the, from observation, it's 29% decrease. And our model simulation is 27% decrease. And among this 27% decrease, 22% uh, comes from solar irradiance. And 2% from a change in magnetic activity. And 3% uh, is, is a trend, mostly due to CO2. So uh, in summary, we looked at the solar irradiance effect Uh, on the, in the upper atmosphere, we look at the rapid change on the time scale from minutes to hours driven by uh, solar flares. And we talked about uh, uh, solar flare effects in the thermosphere, ionosphere, not only depend on its magnitude, but also depend on the location of the flare on the solar disk. And uh, we looked at uh, diurnal variation, which is driven by presence and absence of solar irradiance during day and night, which cause uh, amplitude, diurnal amplitude in mass density about on the order of 100%. And then we look at the solar rotational variation that is driven by the appearance and the disappearance of the active regions in the sun when the sun rotates in about 27 day period. And this solar rotational variation in the thermosphere and ionosphere depend on solar activity. And uh, under moderate solar activity, uh, the amplitude in mass density is about 100%. So next, we look at annual and semi-annual variation that is driven by uh, annual variation in the sun-earth distance, and also <coughs> other internal and the low internal process and uh, low atmospheric forcing. And uh, the amplitude depend on, uh, and depend on a change from year to year, change anywhere from 30% to 250%. And uh, we looked at the, uh, the coupling between the thermosphere and ionosphere in the context of uh, the annual variation and the seasonal summer to winter variation. And then we look at the solar cycle variation that is driven by the intrinsic 11-year uh, variability of the magnetic activity in the sun, which causes um, the largest variation uh, the, in the thermosphere <coughs> and ionosphere. 
and the mass den for the mass density, it is on the order of one order of magnitude. And we looked at, we talked about the most solar cycle variation in composition, thermosphere composition, ON2, occurs in the winter hemisphere. And lastly, we look at the multi-decadal variation. We look at uh, the, the trend in the thermosphere um, that is uh, mostly caused by the greenhouse gas, uh, mostly CO2, which is CO2 cause a trend in the um, global warming in the troposphere and then global cooling above troposphere. Uh, we look at the floor of F10.7 and uh, looked at the, uh, the, the detection of the trend become more complicated because of the multi-decadal variation in solar activity. And uh, we looked at the solar effects on global average, average temperature decrease with the decreasing, decreasing altitude from the mass pores to the surface. So to recap, so we look at this thermosphere ionosphere. It has three external forcing. We have solar irradiance and we have a TI coupling with the magnetosphere from above and the atmos atmosphere from below. And, uh, and also with the internal processes. So under all this forcing and the processes, we have space weather and the space climate phenomenon. So today I mostly focused on the variation with the time, um, but all this variation happens in three dimensions also. There's a vari for each variation, there's a variation with the latitude, uh, with the longitude, and with the altitude. So there's a lot of things that we don't know um, because of different reasons, but two most important reasons is uh, um, limitations uh, in our modeling capability and also limitations in um, observations. So for example, I want to talk about two examples. So one is the global electric field. So the electric field is very important not only in, uh, for to the ionosphere, but it is also very important to the thermosphere. And especially for the uh, equatorial and the low latitude ionosphere, uh, that is, uh, uh, the, which has a plasma instability, which is affect uh, uh, radio communication. So this uh, electric field, the variability of electric field is driven by uh, both by the forcing from above and also from forcing from below, such as uh, tides. And uh, in order to understand um, the driving mechanism uh, to the variability of the electric field, we need to have um, integrated treat ad atmosphere as an integrated system. We need to have a whole atmosphere model. And then the, another example is the annual semi-annual variation in uh, thermosphere composition, the ON2 ratio. So up until not long ago, we only have ON2 um, data from uh, measured by uh, um, the sun-synchronized low Earth orbit satellite, uh, which introduced local time variation uh, in annual semi-annual variation. So we don't really know the, what the actual annual semi-annual variation in composition is, how it varies with the latitude, with the longitude, and with altitude. So, uh, so these are the two projects that uh, I will work on. Um, so one is uh, looking at the variability of global electric field and the impact on the longitudinal structure in the ionosphere using both data and the model. The model that I will use is the WACMX. So the WACMX is a whole atmosphere model which has uh, gone through very intensive development and validation in recent years. So now we uh, can use the WACMX model to look at this, uh, what, what is caused this variability uh, of the global electric field. And the second project is I will look at uh, an annual semi-annual variation of ON2 using uh, gold data. The gold uh, measures uh, thermosphere ON2 from geosynchronous geosynchron geosynchron uh, satellite. Uh, so it measures ON2 you know, like synoptically. So it does not introduce local time variation in, into the annual semi-annual variation. And I will use, also use a WACMX model to look at the driving mechanism to separate uh, the forcing from lower atmosphere and from the atmos upper atmosphere. 
So this is a, uh, so I will leave these uh, slides here. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. So that is uh, that the data is from uh, um, satellite drag data, and that is from uh, uh, John Ambert, and his data he no longer uh, continue to to process those uh, uh, satellite drag data to derive mass density from satellite drag data. So after actually yeah we have up until 2011, and after that we don't have data. So that's why. And didn't show after that. Of course, we have model simulation for model simulation. What's the model simulations for um, So we we already know. Uh, so the the next solar cycle, the, this current solar cycle, and uh, solar activity is uh, is not as stronger as the as the previous solar cycle. But now this uh, solar minimum is very prolonged as well. So. Um, we haven't done the solar minimum of, uh, like, uh, current solar minimum. We haven't do model simulation, but we can do that. Yeah. And I think the current solar minimum looks very similar to the previous solar minimum. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, if, I, if I heard you right, um, I have a question about the relationship between the O to N2 ratio and the electron density mm -hmm. profile. Yeah. And I think you said that the electron density is higher, uh, particularly at the higher altitudes, when the O to N2 ratio is higher. Did I, did I hear that correctly, or am I misinterpreting? Uh, what so you that's said? A, that's a mass density, so it's neutral density. Uh, density. Neutral density, yes. Not electron. Not electron, but the electron density uh, in the F in the F1 region and the, at the F2 peak also proportional to uh, O N2 ratio. So if you have O N2 ratio is higher, you will have higher density electron density as well. But for the neutral density, uh, mass density, uh, so uh, if O N2 ratio is uh, larger, that means uh, in this uh, in this uh, atmosphere there's more atom. Yeah. So the scale height is uh, larger, so the neutral density would decrease slower. Therefore, at higher altitude, you will have a larger mass density. So that's, uh, that's mass density. Okay, so uh, coming back to the issue, the, the relationship between the electron density in the F region and the O to N2 ratio, um, I, I could see where you could have, I mean, I don't know that this is what happens, but you could have a higher O to N2 ratio, but not have as much oxygen necessarily, um, just, just because the N2 is lower. Um, and yet, why would the electron density scale up with O to N2 as opposed to just straight O? Oh, that's because uh, you, you, that's why the, sum, the composition you use the ratio of O N2. So it's a relative concentration that is important. When you have a relatively, you have more. If your O N2 is a, is a larger, that means relatively. If your O N2 increase, that means uh, in relatively you, you are increase O. So you have th that you will have more production of electron, and then the molecular N2. So you have less, relatively you will have less. That will cause less recombination. The re it's the recombination that removes electron. So, so the interpretation higher O to N2 typically means higher O. No, not, nece not necessary. Is O N2? It can be a larger O and two can be because there's more O, but it can yeah can also mean there's less N two. Sure. So yeah. so if you have less N two, that you will have less recombination, even if O does not change. If you remove less, so you still have more electron. Show the chemistry slide. Okay. No, I mean I, I think I kind of get that. What I Show what I'm not slide. what I'm not getting is why. The electron density would necessarily have to be higher 
just because O to N2 is higher, because you just said O to N2 could be higher because N2 is lower. You see what I mean? That means less loss. So your electron density is dependent on the ratio of production and loss. And so if you have less loss, you have more electrons. So uh, this one, so uh, so here, this is a recombination, NO plus O2 plus, and when they recombine with electron and back to neutral. So if you have more molecular, uh, then you will have a larger recombination. So the loss is, it, it will, if you have less molecular, then the loss will be smaller. So even if you don't produce more, you only move less. So. Uh, the loss is less, so you ended ended up uh, uh, have less. I mean, less loss. That that's uh, um, depending on the situation. I guess you, if like uh, at night time, uh, at night time you supposed to lose uh, uh, electron density, and uh, but if you lose less, then you will see at the night time you will see higher electron density compared to other times when the loss is larger. Yeah. How does the NMO cooling uh, um, influence the thermospheric mass density? NMO cooling also dominates the CO2 cooling above mesopause. The NO cooling? Yes. Yeah, the NO cooling, yeah, it's a dominate probably at 115, 20 kilometer region. So yeah, that will reduce temperature and uh, reduce uh, mass density. So is that your question? Yeah, that is uh, on okay. the, any influence of solar variability on NO cooling? So that's solar variability on NO cooling. Yes. Uh, I would imagine, uh, so uh, if you have higher solar activity, you will have higher um, input of the energy. And I believe actually the, uh, the NO cooling will also larger, uh, also larger. And then the atmosphere temperature is a, a, a balance between, uh, between heat and the loss. So uh, at high solar activity, activity, you ended up with higher temperature. Yeah, and then the, we know that the NO cooling at uh, solar maximum is about three times of the NO cooling at solar minimum. Do you have a sense of how uncertainty in the solar input <coughs> affects uncertainty in the model outputs? Like a 20% uncertainty in your solar input, what sort of uncertainty would you expect from your model output? Um, 20% uncertainty. Um, I know that if you uh, change the solar irradiance uh, by, uh, if you have like, a, say, let's say 2% of change in F10.7 index, you will have about 4% of change in mass density in the upper thermosphere. So, uh, yeah, two times. So you mostly mentioned that it's because the active region <coughs> comes go and the chain mostly responsible for the density variation you see. But we also know that solar rotation associated with the active region, you have a high speed strains, yes. CIRs. So how much variation can attribute to the solar irradiation, solar radiation, or how much to the geomagnetic activity associated with CIRs? Um, yeah, so l let me go to that slide. So this one, so if you look at uh, 2003, you, you look at the mass density variation. So apart from the solar rotational variation, you also see uh, even shorter, shorter 
uh, even shorter, uh, shorter term variability, shorter than solar rotational variation. So that would be corresponding to the uh, magnetic activity. So, um, so, so they are on like a high speed extreme, high speed stream. Um, probably you have like a period like two days, seven days, nine days, uh, which is a sub. It's less than 27 day usually. So you you can look at this variability. If it's about 27 days, that would be a solar rotation from solar irradiance, and uh, on top of in. On top of that, there's a shorter term variability that would be from a high speed stream. Yeah. You mentioned that the ratio of O to N2 mm -hmm. is noticeably higher in the winter hemisphere yeah. due to downwelling. Yes. Is that just a, an inertia effect due to more atomic uh, oxygen at higher altitudes or brought down increasingly? Yes, it's uh, the vertical advection. So because the, the we see that uh, in the thermosphere, the, the vertical gradient of the species is very large. It's like exponential. So when you have so such a large vertical vertical gradient, when you have uh, even with a small vertical wind, you will have very large uh, vertical advection, contrib contribution from vertical advection. Yes, it is because at the upper, at higher altitude, you have a relatively you have more atomic oxygen. So when you bring it down, then you that you raises e the average. Yeah, you increase the O into ratio. Yeah. Have you investigated the uh, variability in neutral density with within intraseasonal time scales, and how much of that could be connected to geomagnetic or solar forcing? From geomagnetic, geomagnetic forcing. Um, um, geomagnetic forcing. Geomagnetic forcing can be very large. You know, if during storm, you you probably get uh, um, five, you know, like five times of increase of uh, uh, mass density. So magnetic forcing is also very large. Um, during storm, and then even when the magnetic activity is uh, not very, so here, actually here is an example. So uh, this is a very quiet 2008, and then the AP index is uh, is small, you know, it's like 20, probably KP is uh, like one, probably at most two. But then you can see that uh, in the mass density, there's a lot of variability from this very small low low ac low magnetic activity. So magnetic activity is a uh, is very big forcing and uh, to the mass density. So, but today, so here just uh, didn't talk about this. Yeah. 